Close your eyes for a second while I open the house. Before me in the east, Nephthys, behind me in the west, Isis, on my right hand in the south is Set, and on my left hand in the north is Horus. For above me shines the body of Nuit, the star goddess, and below me extends the ground of Geb. And in my centre abideth the great hidden god. Uh, it's a sad day to be talking about some of these topics, uh, so I'd like to dedicate this to Alan Hamming, who was killed by uh, Islamic State yesterday. Those of you who heard me speak in uh, Reading a few months ago may have See, I showed this film there as well. I didn't show the whole film, uh, but it's such a fascinating film, and uh, it's well worth seeing even a little bit of it again. It's very unusual. It's actually given to me by the person I showed you the picture of. He, he by and he, a lot of this stuff that happened to me in Egypt was kind of coincidence and uh, serendipity and, and whatever. I mean, he sent his computer off to be repaired, so quite sort of, and it came back with this film on it. Uh, and he said, you'd be interested in this film. And you can see it's very, very fuzzy, right? It's been copied many, many times. I don't know if you can find this on the internet. Uh, it's in French, but we're not gonna, that's not going to matter, right? I just want to it demonstrates very, very clearly... I'm going to show two extracts from this film. It demonstrates very, very clearly the rationality of the methods that I use to uh, learn something about Egyptian magic, ancient Egyptian magic, from the local people uh, who actually live in, in Luxor. I, uh, I'm using a technique that's uh, got a posh name called archaeological memory, uh, which means you can reconstruct Egyptian magical means by looking at the people who are still practicing the same techniques in Luxor today. Uh, which is a controversial idea, uh, but in fact, even in the academic sphere now, uh, they've, which is where the term archaeological memory comes from, there are more and more examples of, of, uh, of, the, of proving that the locals are actually practicing Egyptian magic one way or another. And you have the textual sources of Egyptian magic, but you can sort of get direct teachers there. Not, I, I'm not saying he's a teacher, as I say, he's not really a teacher. It's, it, you can find people who want to do it with you, want to do magic with you for one reason or another. Anyway, this film, it's by a famous French archaeologist who was uh, in charge of the excavations at the Temple of Karnak. I think it's made in about 1960. It's quite an old film. And essentially what he's doing, he's, if, if people have ever been to, to Luxor, right in the centre of this modern city is an ancient pharaonic temple, a uh, temple of uh, Amun-Min, right? a phallic form of uh, Amun. Uh, and if you know, so you've got Amun, the sort of old father, but he's always shown with an erection. And the city itself, its ancient name means city of the scepter. And in some ways, <laughs> you know, if you think about what a scepter is, uh, in some ways, Luxor is still the city of the scepter. Right? It's still big sex thing there. Uh, but he starts, what he does, he starts, he shows us the Temple of Luxor, and he shows us some very interesting carvings on there, and you won't understand what he's saying, but essentially he's, he's saying, look, this describes a ritual that was conducted in this temple thousands of years ago in the Pharaonic times. Uh, and people, the army came and they marched up and down, the Pharaonic army, and people slaughtered, had a big feast and slaughtered lots of animals. And there was martial arts competitions between the local men to prove their prowess. And there were images of the goddess paraded around. Uh, all kind of things are described in this frieze. And then he, he, he tells you that right in the middle of the temple is a mosque, a very old mosque, built into the temple itself. And then so he shifts then from describing, he walks out of the temple and essentially he says, the rituals that are described on the wall of the temple are now performed as he walks out 
outside the temple there, or essentially in the temple. So the very same rituals that are described in the, on the temple walls are at the moment of the film is made, then reenacted by the local population. Thousands and thousands of people gathering to do this ritual and this, this uh, festival just outside the gates and in the mosque, which is a kind of... Islam there is kind of different to the stuff that we're kind of getting shoved in our direction at the moment, but uh, it's much more liberal, not fanatical, uh, but more Sufi based and whatever. But uh, anyway, so show the first few minutes of the film so we'll see that. It's rather an extraordinary film, I think. <laughs> uh, and not, it's not just interesting sort of uh, intellectually or, or whatever. Uh, there are all sorts of techniques, even in the film. There are all sorts of things shown. Uh, sometimes you don't really know you're looking at a... You couldn't tell what, what, whether this was a Muslim ritual or a voodoo ritual to be honest. The kind of things there that you might see on a film about voodoo uh, happening, all sorts of ritual stuff. Uh, in my uh, group, we do a lot of work now with uh, using some of these mater this uh, material, uh, using, uh, well, I'll describe some of the, all the different aspects of it, this sort of trance work uh, and dance, especially dance and in this uh, Take, there's a rather interesting dance, uh, which I really like. Uh, so you can kind of see how they, they did the, the description of it. Okay, so the topic today is, broadly speaking, uh, concerns demons, inverted commas. <coughs> if it, a demon, what is a demon? Or what is the difference between a demon and a monster? Have you ever thought about that? Can anybody think about the difference between a demon and a monster? Okay, you got an idea? What's it? Uh, a demon is something you can constrain to do something for you. Right. Or you can ask, or you can get something out of it, whereas a monster is just something that is generally not good and can run away. Okay. Everybody agree with that? Okay, my word, I, I haven't got something as complicated as that. <laughs> a de. <laughs> A demon, then, as I mentioned before, strictly speaking, is an animal head on a human body. 
right? And the, that image of the animal head on a human body, usually a goat's head on a human body, is very, very old. It goes back right to the to the Stone Age art and everything like that. It's almost like as soon as we became human beings, we started seeing these creatures uh, with our own bodies and a human head, uh, so animal head on them, one sort or another. So it's a, some sort of composite being. Uh, essentially, a monster is a human head on an animal body. Uh, and the mon monsters don't date, don't go back quite as far, interestingly enough. There's a particular moment in our history where monsters kind of erupt into our uh, popular consciousness, uh, perhaps in Mesopotamia, early Mesopotamian ritual. Pazuzu in the film The Exorcist is a good example of a, a human head on this kind of monstrous animal body with wings and uh, animal feet. So, I don't know, so there's a, there is a difference between a demon and a monster. And monsters are more modern in a way. And maybe that's something to do with something that happened to us at that point in our history, that monsters started appearing in our dreams. Uh, when, whereas previously people hadn't see, don't seem to have had that encounter. I've been looking, as I say, at various aspects, because of the clues in something like the film, I've been looking for clues, ways of reconstructing Egyptian magic from survivals in, amongst the Muslim population and the Sufi population, the Coptic population. Uh, and I've shown, shown why that's a viable point of view. And there are lots and lots of articles now written about other things that uh, show that this is, th this is the way to go. You can actually find virtually living practitioners, if you know what they're called, uh, of the Egyptian magic. Or you can use and reconstruct that. Okay, we'll show the second bit of okay, the second bit of film just before we put the PowerPoint on and show you the pictures. The second bit of film. Can you put the sound up? That is, for me, a kind of quite interesting Crowley as well and Thelema. That's what a Thelemic ritual should look like. And I was, one of the chants they do, obviously we're talking to some extent about Islam, uh, and that might be taboo for some people, especially on such a difficult day. Uh, but I don't know. I think we. I think the magic community needs to do this. I mean, could I ask, as people here, of any of you, I'm not. I should say, I'm not a Muslim. Right? I'm a pagan and a magician. Uh, and the people in Egypt that I work with know that. I mean, they say they hope that I will convert to Islam. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that they say. What are you into uh, as we're at the mountain? What is it? What, tell me exactly what it is that you, to me, what, what do you believe in? You know, are you a kind of mystic or what? So they're kind of winkling me out, but they, they would like me to become a Muslim. But can I, uh, but I said, no, that's not going to happen, but I'm respectful. I, th I think it's quite important that we're respectful. Uh, I know there's a tendency amongst uh, our community and everybody, everybody wants to have a go at the Muslims at the moment. I mean, who can... It's kind of natural, I suppose, uh, with terrible things. But also, in general, as we know, right, in our community, because we're kind of Thelemites and pagans and we've got a kind of funny history with, uh, in terms of the Abrahamic face, we kind of slag, our tendency to slag them off, right, and say, you know, you're all idiots and you're inhibited and blah, blah. But in a way, the, 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 we've got to let that go. We've got to grow up as in our religion, we've got to make, we've got to build bridges, and it's worth doing because there's stuff that we they uh, that community needs to know, and we need we can learn from them. Uh, 
So I was going to say, has anybody here read the Quran? You've read the Quran or looked at the Quran? You've looked at the Quran. I'm not going to go on about too much about the Quran, but that's good. But I would say. <laughs> uh, uh, the Quran is a magical book. It definitely is. That's why there is so much energy and violence uh, at the moment. In a way, the stuff that we're seeing in the world shows you the potential for that sort of magic. Uh, I, and, you know, obviously I was a little bit worried being a pagan for a long time whether there be a problem for someone like me in a uh, Muslim country, uh, being an open pagan, whatever. Uh, but I was told, no, the magic is Quranic. Uh, magic is, uh, is in the Quran. Uh, the, there's no objection to the practice of magic. Uh, uh, for, in fact, this is very, uh, the stuff I'm doing is not going to be Quran Quranic, incidentally, but it's one of the most important streams of magic in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, just like the Bible, I suppose, uh, there, are also, there are whole chapters here on demons, right? There's a whole chapter on the jinn and demons in, in this book. Uh, I'm not saying that they're all bastards either, saying that uh, the jinn are useful. Not all, not all of the jinn, uh, the demons are uh, bad things. They're quite, they have their uses, uh, which I'll talk about. And in fact, if you if you remember, if you this is the penguin edition. If you do have one, you have to treat it. And you know, Muslim people, they don't like you to disrespect this book in any way. So they don't like you to write shopping notes in it or anything like that or just leave it on a, on a counter or something like that, like we treat our normal books. They like you to treat it like you would Abramelin uh, or a magical book, as if it does have magical power. And if you look at the beginning of it, you probably haven't so the beginning of the book has got three special letters, Aleph, Lam, Min. Nobody knows, no Muslim can explain to you what those letters mean. Uh, no ordinary Muslim. It's uh, straight from the beginning. This is a, a strange magical book. And in fact, lots of magical practitioners use stuff from this book as magic. And it is full of rituals for protection and whatever. So it's quite, quite important to kind of at least be aware of those things. Now, obviously, when we're talking about Islamic magic, well, we kind of know this already, right? That it's, all, it's there in our books, sort of, isn't it? That all of the grimoires and all of the books on yoga and books on astrology, uh, our number system, uh, all the sort of intellectual wealth of the classical world is, is mediated to us, comes to us via Islam, via uh, Arabic translations of these classic books. Uh, so we kind of know that we're, they are part of our history as much as anybody else. Sometimes we focus a little bit too much on uh, Hebrew Kabbalah and we forget that an awful lot of this stuff has come to us from translations from the medieval times and uh, from medieval Islam. And they weren't just, in, uh, they weren't just theoretical, they were practitioners of magic. In, uh, in the medieval period. And their books on magic are better than our books. Uh, they're, they're more detailed and uh, they're more effective. Um, in fact, early European archaeology used Islamic magical books on treasure hunting to find pharaonic tombs. Which is, uh, they didn't want this stuff to be too well known at the time, but that's what they use. They're, they're, that's still uh, knowledge today that treasure hunting Islamic books, because treasure hunting in Islam is a, is a religious activity. It proves your faith. We could, like psychic question, it proves the power of magic if you find some object on your quest. It's the same. It says in the Quran. It's in the Quran. If it's in the Quran, you're okay. It says that uh, when the Hebrews left uh, Egypt, uh, they left their property buried in the ground, uh, most of it. They couldn't take it all with them. 
They left their houses and their wealth buried in the ground. So it's buried in the ground. It says that in the Quran. Therefore, if you can find the stuff buried in the ground, you prove the truth of the Quran. Therefore, it's religiously good thing to do. So that's why it's very common there. But obviously, it's, this is a very ambiguous activity. Very, very ambiguous. Because, as we know, it's, it's, what's the difference between treasure hunting and grave robbing? Or tomb robbery. We, we, we sort of tolerate the idea of treasure hunting in graveyards and the psychic questing, because why do we do that? Because we think they're not going to really find anything much. But as you know, in Egypt you only have to dig below your feet, a few feet, and you'll find something. You know, it's just everywhere. Uh, and that's a problem for an ambiguity. <coughs> so, after the revolution, I kind of felt easier about going to Egypt, to be honest. And it's, it's now it's kind of strange. It's very much more edgy than it ever was, because it's so wide open. It's like the Wild West. Uh, and by one reason or another, I, stum this is, uh, I stumbled into these group of people. Uh, and I should say, you might not recognize this, but this is uh, a part of the what's called the Theban Necropolis, which is a holy mountain. Holy, H-O-L-Y. Holy mountain in Egypt that's been holy since forever. And everybody wants to be buried on this. And this is uh, Dru Abu Al Naga, which means the the arm. It's a village called the Arm of the Wise Man of the Village. <coughs> and once upon a time, you can see up on the hill, you can see tombs. You see that? Tombs. And then there's a, a village built on top of it, essentially. And some of these are what's called tomb houses. The houses where your basement is a tomb, a pharaonic tomb. It's an Arab house where your basement is a pharaonic tomb. Uh, and this is quite important to us. If people, people read the Greek magical papyri in translation, right? The, the Betts book, right? Everybody's kind of pouring over at the moment. Uh, which, even though it's called the Greek Magical Papyri in translation, it originally comes from this area. The person who wrote that collection of spells comes from this area. And the person who found the book, the modern edition of the book, he <coughs> lived there. He lived in one of these houses. It's like Petrie, the father of Egyptian archaeology, because he's kind of like us, well, I know he's like, maybe he wouldn't do this, when he wasn't digging up Egyptian tombs, he used to live in Egyptian tombs. Yeah? He set up his base, rather than building a house, he said, oh, because he was a bit mean, right? You know this, he never cooked any food. Uh, he always used to take tins of spam. Uh, and they would just eat cold spam, or whatever it was, for their dinner every night. After a whole day's excavation of the site, they would, the whole lot, his wife and everything, they would just eat tin out of tins. It's weird. And then at the end of the excavation season, they'd bury the leftover tins in the ground. It was so mean, you see, that, so that they could get them next year. So they're not even having fresh stuff. I mean, this is, but he's, a, he's an incredible person. But rather than build a house to live in, he just, oh, well, we just live in one of the empty tombs. And so that's a very common practice, and I think locals as well have got into that idea. If it's an empty tomb, why not live in it? But that has consequences uh, to the people who live in the tombs. There's the, 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 the spirits of the tombs are still there, right? That's what the locals say. They have to, part of the reason they're good at magic is because they, uh, they live in a graveyard, essentially. They live in one of the largest graveyards in the world. And if you do that, and it's such as the ancient Egyptians who are the masters of magic and the spirit world, you know that it's going to be full of spirits, and it, and it is. Anyway, so there's the, the village with these people, part of the village. Uh, next slide. And that's, there's a view of it. These are the houses of the, the these are tomb houses, you see. This is uh, Abu Al Naga, the top hill. There's lots of tombs there, tombs of the nobles. All under the, here, yeah, this is an old graveyard with Arab houses on top of it. Yeah. And. <coughs> And this is, if you've ever been here, this is the road that leads up to 
I think this is right. To the Temple of Hatshepsut. Next slide. <coughs> this is it now. Right? Completely destroyed. Three years ago, before the revolution, it was coincides. When I first when I first went to Egypt, I went to a lecture uh, at the Mummification Museum where they have an academic report from all the teams excavating, all the foreigners excavating in Luxor report on their research. Uh, and rather gleefully, the report was that one of the famous tombs was now available to be looked at again because all the Arab houses had been destroyed. Ha ha. Uh, but don't worry, we've rehoused them three miles away, uh, and we're going to tidy up this so the tourists don't have to encounter the locals, right? As, this is a pattern now. They don't have to encounter the locals, and they haven't got their houses on top of the tomb, so us Western archaeologists can get in there, and of course we're... Our religion is science, and we never do any damage, and uh, you know we're not interested in treasure. Uh, we're just purely scientific. And so the government then, uh, Mubarak, betrayed the locals and destroyed their village. <coughs> and you can see what's underneath. There's the rubble of the houses, and then these are entrances to tombs. I mean, this is a difficult issue. It is difficult. Because the things that they discover in the tombs are very, very interesting. Anyway, then you have the revolution and demolition stop. Uh, this is just when I started going there uh, to meet these people. And UNESCO said this, the destruction of the Arab village was the worst cultural catastrophe of, uh, of the last few years. The destruction of the Arab village was the worst cultural catastrophe. It was a complete fuck up, basically, uh, because they didn't know. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't really look into what who, who these people were. Essentially, you've destroyed the houses of the people who built the tombs, in some sense. Or certainly they have a longer relationship with magic and the tombs and the Egyptian religion than, than the archaeologists do. And they have uh, no knowledge. So UNESCO kicked up a huge fuss about this and further demolitions have been stopped for the time being. Uh, but obviously there's a lot of bad feeling there. Uh, and, you know, and one of the archaeological associations, because there was a lot of people complaining about this, not just, there's, obviously there are archaeologists who are just, I don't know, the imperialist. Basically they're imperialist and they're racist. And uh, they don't think there's anything to learn from this. But there are other archaeologists, like that lady on the telly and whatever, who realise that these people are memory. They have a memory. They may even be the original people who built the tombs in the first place. You should check that out before you knock their villages down. <coughs> so now there's a, a rescue archaeology mission, rather strangely, financed by the American University to do rescue archaeology on the Arab houses, which have only been knocked down for two years. And they're financing now to re-excavate the houses just in case there was something there that maybe they should have looked at. And this is not, this has happened lots of times before in Egyptian archaeology. Uh, in the temple at Mad Medinet Habu, which is nearby, all of the stuff that wasn't like posh stone, the mud brick stuff, which is older, was all completely cleared out before they started the excavation. They just bulldozed it out, basically. And people said later, it would have been quite handy to look at that stuff. <laughs> but it's all gone now. And that quite often happens. OK, next slide. So you can see these were houses and these are tombs behind and underneath the houses. You can walk through this. Well, no, technically, if you go there as a, <coughs> a tourist, they don't like you walking through this area. They don't like you to go there. But because I have friends there now, I can kind of, they took me through this. And this is the easiest way up onto the mountain as well. Okay, so we're up on the mountain. This is quite green and agricultural. That's the Nile Valley. We're just on the edge of the desert. Uh, that's where people buried their dead there. Okay, keep that. So in the 
rescue archaeology that is, that is taking place on the villages that are, that are lost, including the house of my friend. His family house uh, was destroyed. And the football pitch was destroyed and all the different things there. Uh, was, you know, it's an interesting story in itself. They found fragments of... These are copies. These, this is their work. Their work is making copies of things that they sell to tourists. They're very, very accurate. Uh, well, it depends how much you pay. Uh, you know, if you pay top rate, then you'll get a completely accurate copy of a very honest thing that nobody will be able to tell if it, who, who did it uh, to sort of slightly less things. So that's their job, so the broken piece there. And these scribbled bits of paper is actually a love spell. Uh, and it's a love spell that invokes the power of the constellation, the plough, to deal with the problems of fertility and love of a particular person. Uh, all right, it looks like a scribble, but a kind of a, the person who wrote that spell, I've kind of, well, I may have shown this before, but um, I've can't, I, I can't say I've tracked them down, but my friend, he's tracked down the, the magical specialist who did this work. And I'll show you some other stuff of his, hopefully, in a minute. <clears throat> so even with just a quick look through the rubble, they found that the people of the village are magical practitioners there, or they're using magical specialists to do their work. <clears throat> okay, in the golden age of Islam, People, I've mentioned that people use all sorts of texts. Okay. <laughs> in in the film, right, with the the dance, right, which is the I work on lots of different dances now from uh, from this tradition, the, and I'm suggesting you see what well, one of the things they chant is Allah. Right, obviously, and if you think about it, if you're into Crowley and stuff like that, Allah is the god of Crowley, essentially Al and La, as we, as, as we know, although one way or another. And Crowley was, of all the influences on Crowley from that, Islam is probably one of the strongest influences on Crowley. Lots of his rituals are full of prayers from the Sufi tradition. Uh, and he had a huge respect, I think, for Islam. He would probably have been better off being a Sufi. If he'd have listened to his secret chief, Iwas, and um, returned to Egypt and actually looked for the tomb of uh, Ankafna Khonsu, or looked for the traces of Ankafna Khonsu, he would have got it, found himself in Luxor, in ancient Thebes. And the uh, history of Thelema would be bit different. Anyway, as we know, we've got the, in Salema we have the mantra Lashtal, which is La Al and Set in, in the center. So rather than do it, I, I, I guess, I don't know, how would people feel about doing, you probably wouldn't want to do Allah, or do, you know, it might be a bit much. But, um, so that brainwave, you could do Lashtal to that, and that, to that dance. See, Thelemic magic is too static. It's too. It, do, it doesn't have enough movement and dance. Crowley was a dancer, and Victor Neuberg were a dancer, but they've kind of a little bit lost that tradition. So, this is one of the things I've kind of learned from that. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe someone will explain to me later that even in. See, Crowley is supposed to kind of get rid of all religions, isn't he, in the Book of the Law? He's supposed to sort of. In the third book of the Book of the Law, he kind of trash, says, I'm going to trash them all uh, and peck so-and-so's eyes out and God knows what. And I flap my wings in the face of Muhammad and blind him. But some people think that's... It doesn't mean what it says. It means something else. It means he's kind of doing something with that. Okay, so I'll go specifically to the topic of demons. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so this is the view from the Theban necropolis, uh, which you can walk. So the whole this is a holy mountain shaped like a pyramid, and uh, if you go right to the top, which is quite a climb, uh, 
but you can do. Uh, there's a beach. <laughs> there's a prehistoric beach on the top of the mountain, and you can find seashells there. And it's obvious that people knew, have noticed that right for a long time. So it's one of the reasons why it's such a special magical mountain is the fact that it has this incredibly archaic, because it's in the middle of a desert, and yet it looks as if it ought to be by the sea. Uh, there's a temple of Hatshepsut. Next one. <coughs> there's a view from the top. Someone said it looks like a kind of IKEA flat pack. <laughs> <laughs> Hatshepsut Temple. It is very modern looking. Yeah, Egyptian aesthetic is very uh, can be very modern. Okay, next one. Uh, can't remember the yeah, Valley of the Kings. So the way to get to the Valley of the Kings is to walk over the mountain, <coughs> which we did. We do quite a lot. It's, it's quite doable if you're reasonably fit, and if you're very fit, you can go further. You can go a long walk through the mountains. It's quite straightforward, as long as you don't get caught in a storm. Um, I don't know if I've got the right pictures now, but I'll show you later. <laughs> okay, next one. Okay. <coughs> so, Islam uh, came to Egypt with the Arab invasion in about the 7th century AD. Uh, and as you might expect, when the Arabs arrived, they found that the place was already had its own system of demons uh, and of angels and all the rest. And the system that they found, which is part Coptic and part of survival from the ancient Egypt, is uh, it, the Egyptian system is itself quite contradictory. Uh, you know, lots of it, you couldn't. It would be very difficult for me to kind of resolve the Egyptian system of demons into a nice, neat uh, hierarchy and system. It it doesn't quite work like that uh, because you kind of think the further I go back in time, the simpler things are going to get. But it it isn't quite like that. Sometimes the further back you go in time, the more complicated it gets. So that makes me think that systems of demons and uh, spiritual entities are never going to be nice and neat. Uh, and maybe we should probably abandon the idea, if we ever had it, that in our own modern sp dealings with spirits, we shouldn't look for neatness. Uh, um, we should in uh, entertain contradictory uh, patterns of, of entities in our system, because it's always been like that. Nobody's ever been able to resolve these systems into, into one thing. And that's why I think, say, the Islamic system as well is already complex. It's itself complex. It's not simple. Uh, Islamic, Islam, you don't, maybe you don't hear about this very much. We, we kind of get one thing. But Islam divides uh, uh, the world up into three basic categories of human beings, uh, the jinn, Right, or which, from which we get the word genie, the jinn, who are creatures of fire, and angels, angels being kind of messenger things, really. Uh, the jinn and the human beings have free will. They can choose, and the, the jinn can choose to be Muslim or Christian or wherever they want to be. And some of the jinn are for us, for Westerners. They help us. To help the unbelievers do things, uh, which is rather strange, I know. Angels are sort of automata. They are bearers of structure. They, they don't, they maybe in some senses, are not such useful things to encounter because they kind of have their role, their thing that they do, which is to give the message, or they, if they represent a particular element or whatever, they do that. And they don't really, they're not really supposed to go outside of that script. And if, they, if an angel goes outside of the script, you might think that it's probably not an angel that you're dealing with. You're dealing with the jinn, who do often uh, masquerade as angels, because they like things like that. Uh, so that's the Islamic view, but it's not as simple as that, because there's Islam also preserves all sorts of other uh, sets of uh, spirits, including spirits from the Pharaonic times. So the Pharaonic, these people who lived in the mountain, they regularly encounter spirits of the tombs who are Pharaonic shaitans. They're called Pharaonic, a type of spirit called a shaitan, from which we get our name, Satan, of course, but it's got a kind of more general meaning there of a class of spirits called a shaitan, usually a little bit 
bit malign. Uh, difficult to say, but <coughs> there's a particular type of shaitan called a pharaonic shaitan, which is, i.e., it's a shaitan, it's a, it's a dangerous spirit that lives in pharaonic tombs, and it, you have to know certain bits of magic uh, to counteract it, otherwise it'll kill you. Um, or li more likely, it won't kill you, but it'll kill the first person in the tomb. It'll, it'll kill someone in the family, usually the children. Uh, as you know, if you study some of the early uh, stuff in the Greek magical papyri, they talk about you use children as spirit mediums uh, in the ancient world. I, I don't know if that's a, mis uh, a mistake in translation, but certainly there's a tradition that grows up from that, that children are, are more sensitive to these things and you should use them as spirit mediums. And in the modern world, people do use children to contact pharaonic shaitans and tell them where the tomb is, and as a result of which the child sometimes does get ill and die. Uh, and or then another type of specialist co practitioner to come and deal with the possession of the child to stop them dying. Very dubious morally, I admit. <coughs> so they have these other spirits from me, but they also have ghosts. They have a, a, a sort of other class of spirits called ghosts. And then there are spirits of other foreigners who, who like the Sudanese or, or whatever who happen to come in there and they have all their systems. So they have a very messy system in Islam. They have a very messy system in Pharaonic Egypt. Essentially, two messy systems equal each other. Must be the same, really. <coughs> okay, there are three types of practitioners basically, but this isn't true either because I can think of loads more. There, as I was explaining, there are some practitioners own, who can read and some people, practitioners who can, can't read. And if they're clever and they can read and they've studied the Quran at school, they can use the Quran as their magical book. Uh, and they do things, but there's another type of practitioner called Master of the Rod. Uh, a master of the rod is the kind of top of the league, if you like, for this sort of stuff. He knows all the ancient spirit names and how to subdue them. Uh, the key figure, who is the ultimate master of the rod? <laughs> the ultimate master of the rod is Solomon. Solomon is the master of the rod. Uh, so essentially they use a form of Solomonic magic. In fact, if, if you want to know something about Solomonic magic, that is big stuff, big deal in the Middle East Solomonic magic. Uh, and in fact, even in the Quran, rather great uh, story about Solomon in the Quran, lots of stories about Solomon in the Quran. The question is, put to the Prophet, peace be upon him, why is it that when Solomon died, that the jinn, so Solomon used his rod, he has power over the jinn, and he sets them to work in Egypt, in Luxor, essentially, quarrying stone for temples all over the Middle East. And when Solomon dies, thousands of years ago, whenever it was, the jinn carry on working. They don't stop working. And so they asked the prophet, why don't the jinn notice that he's died? Uh, and the answer is, in the Quran, that when he died, he was kept standing up and resting on his rod. And the, uh, so he's, st he's, he's there, standing on his rod, rotting away. And the jinn don't notice he's dead for thousands of years until Muhammad comes along and said, he's dead. No, what, uh, Allah, Allah sends a, a worm, a worm to eat his staff. And he burrows into his staff, the termites, the staff rots away, the corpse flops on the floor, and they, all the jinns say, he's dead. Um, and then they stop doing it. Now that's a fantastic piece of folklore on any level, right, to find in a holy book uh, about Solomon and, uh, and also this uh, lovely story about why the jinn carry on. <coughs> Solomon uh, developed his system of the seven charms. Uh, so seven, the number seven is, is the sacred number. Uh, and 
As all some of these systems like the Testament of Solomon and whatever look very complicated, the essence of the system as practiced there resolves into seven basic charms or spells, which Solomon learned in the essentially in the Egyptian desert uh, from the jinn, who uh, while he was on a desert pilgrimage, he managed to capture the jinn and extort this secret from them. The second category of practitioners in ancient uh, in modern Egypt are those who are possessed by spirits. If you're possessed by a spirit in this tradition, uh, then you'll often become a magical practitioner and a wonder worker. Then your spirit will possess you, will give you the power. It may completely drive you mad. I mean, there are kind of, na- strangely, there are naked ascetics right, in uh, Egypt, or there were in the 1930s, people who won't wear clothes. Uh, which, if you think about that society where they're supposed to be so uptight and everything, the idea of a naked guy just living his entire life, he won't put clothes on because he's too nuts to do that. Uh, but they say, well, he's nuts, you know, he's possessed by the spirits, and nothing you can do about it. But as it happens, he's very, very good at curing headaches or whatever it might be. He's got her magical power to compensate for his madness. So the spirit that possesses him gives him a little bit something back to make up for it. So there's a transaction. And the third category are dabblers in spells, which is probably a category I fall into, I think they'd say. I'm a dabbler, uh, one way or another. Okay, so the category... Can you ca- carry on a little bit? <coughs> Hello, look. <laughs> okay, next one, you have to flick through quickly. This is um, a place called the w- Western Valley. If you go to Egypt now, you can often be completely on your own and deserted, right? And uh, this is so you've got the Valley of the Queens, uh, Queens, sorry, Valley of the Kings, and then you've got another valley which is also called the Valley of the Monkey or the Western Valley, uh, which has got at the moment it's got th- about three tombs they've found in there, and one of them is open to the public. So we, you can walk up there as well. A very, very preternaturally quiet place, right? Very scary, and. You've got to kind of imagine this a few years ago when there, when there was no electricity in uh, in Egypt. They didn't have so many street lights. Now, it's the same now, actually, because <laughs> most of the street lights and everything have been trashed. Uh, whereas they've illuminated, a few years ago, they illuminated the whole Acropolis. All the light bulbs have been stolen now. So it's pitch, pitch black again. And uh, when you're in the pitch black, demons demons like darkness, right? That's the way they look at it. If you, the best way to get rid of a, the a unpleasant entity is turn the lights on, as we know, or light a lamp. Plato says spirits don't like light; uh, it drives them away. Okay. So, one of the things about this thing, the locals don't like to go there. They don't like this valley very much. They have to work there because there's a tomb. So we got to this point and Iman said, you go on, <laughs> go on by yourself. I don't want to go any further. He said, but you'll like it, you'll like this. Uh, but I, I don't want I don't fancy it, I don't fancy it. So we go a bit further into this valley and he said, the reason why they don't, next slide, they don't like this is because there's a, a shaitan lives here. There's a spirit of some sort lives in this valley. A scary one. And the guards, normally they crash out here in the tombs or there's a little house that they sleep in. They won't do it here. They won't stay. Because there have been fatalities. Uh, people, it touches people, if you know what I mean. It pulls their clothing. I think actually what this is, I, they, I thought it was originally, when I first showed this lot, I thought it was going to be a, one of the shaitan spirits, uh, t- which is a type of, type of jinn. <coughs> but when they told me more about the story, that the guy, the first guy who died was um, one of the guards, and they have to spend their shift. They work all day and they sleep during, uh, up in the valley. They don't go home. Uh, he was having problems at home with his wife and uh, his family, and he shot himself uh, in the valley in the middle of the night. And in Islam, uh, 
suicide is kind of like a sin, as it is in a lot of these Abrahamic religions. And but you can, you're not eternally damned if you commit suicide in this tradition. But you, what you do is, um, you have to repeat every night. You have to repeat your death. You have to. You, so essentially, you go on this cycle of endlessly shooting yourself every night, committing suicide every night. You have to relive the suicide every night until such a point in which you're forgiven, or some local magical practitioner gets you f let off the hook, and then you can carry on and be re reborn or whatever. So, which is very like. Um, some aspects of ghost law that you find in the classical tradition, where uh, you the manner of your death, the ghost sort of repeats, reprises the manner of their death over and over again as a sort of automata. So I guess this is it, what this might be. Although, <coughs> to really test this out, next slide, you have to go there. People do go there. Lutz, Lutz was there. Next one. And spend the night. But uh, I don't know, I'm quite at the ball to do this yet, to be honest. <laughs> but I kind of think it is a spirit in uh, Toma. And then, so then the later people who go there, they encounter this ghost and uh, it scares them to death. They don't want to stay. And the people there are kind of used to stuff that we wouldn't do. And yet they won't go here. They wouldn't stay here the night. He wouldn't come with me. Okay. But you can see it's a very, lots of little, kind of canyons and stuff and shadows. This is a shadow. You definitely feel there's a power here and there's something watching you. It is a scary place. Okay, go on. And you can see the rock formations. If you imagine this in the dark and everything, how this would work on your imagination. Uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, yeah, no, I think there is a real spirit. Okay, next one. <coughs> you get the idea. And of course, all these valleys have got tombs in them as well, so it could well be one of the spirits of the tomb, because they come out, play around, come on. I've been working, because of the people that I know and everything, I've been working with a particular class of spirits, uh, just quickly, in this tradition called the Sa, uh, spelled Z-A-R. And essentially, they're, a, they're, f they're, they're the, not Islamic. <coughs> Uh, the, in fact, some of the more um, religious uh, fanatics, when they see people practicing the Sa trance, because it's a trance tradition, dance tradition, magical invocation thing, uh, which claims to go back to ancient Egypt, they say that the Sa spirits are the jinn. Uh, but that's like to drag it down, if you like, to say... Uh, Oh, well, they're just jinn, right? They're not, you shouldn't be dealing with those, right? You shouldn't be, uh, either that's for women, or that's with a derogatory thing, maybe they're going to be nasty about it, or it's not Islamic, it's the Tsar. So they're spirits from another time, they're spirits from the past age that people still work with. And dealing with these spirits, <coughs> well, the, I suppose well, the shaitans are the closest you'll get to the European idea of a demon. Uh, so they could be, but the Tsar spirits are not necessarily demonic. They can be. They possess people, uh, and in order to get rid of the possession, you have to know their name, and you have to know a particular song cycle. You have to know a beat on the drum, uh, which is their call. And rather than bl uh, blasting them, you don't blast these spirits and destroy them, because that won't work anyway. That was tried in pharaonic times, that <coughs> people were possessed by difficult spirits from the Sudan and from Nubia. Uh, they get all the powerful magicians in to try and blast them with all these blood-curdling spells, and it never worked. It made things worse. They kind of end up killing the person who was possessed. So they don't like to be blasted. You have to entertain them. Uh, and the thing they like, because they, they like a uh, good feast, lots of food, lots of alcohol and drugs, and an uh, all-night party of drumming and dancing and general craziness, good stuff. <coughs> uh, the spirits uh, most active at dawn, midday, and sunset which are called the two reds, which corresponds with the ancient Egyptian liturgical times uh, of dawn, midday, sunset, which is standardized to nine o'clock, midday, three o'clock. 
which is, you know, if you use the standard timings, very, very nice timings, actually. Nine o'clock in the morning, not so bad. Twelve o'clock's not so bad. Three o'clock, last service of the day, it's okay. Uh, but maybe if you're going to do it dawn, midday, sunset, the two reds, that's when the spirits are most active in this tradition. And if you're not a practitioner, you have to avoid doing certain things then. If you are a practitioner, that's when you work on them. There are two ways of dividing them into black spirits and red spirits. <coughs> black spirits, ri aswad, are... Uh, uh, the things like the jinn, who are creatures of fire, and the shayetin, the shaitans. Uh, they are very, very troublesome, and you have to really know what you're doing to deal with those. They cause disease, and there's a specialist practitioner called a faki, who uh, knows, supposed to know all that, and he uses the seven basic charms to do that. Uh, as I say, the shayetin are the closest you'll get to the European idea of demon. Uh, and just to confuse that, there's, as I say, there's also the Ferionic Shaitan, which are the, the spirits of the tombs. Now the red spirits, in Sa, we deal with what's called the red spirits. And because I'm a, into the god Set, Set being the uh, ancient red god, uh, obviously uh, ears prick up when you say the red spirits. The red spirits, that must be <coughs> for me, really. Uh, so the red spirit, which is why I've kind of connected uh, the practice of Sa, uh, Sa trance with the uh, Setian mythos for all sorts of reasons now. It really makes sense that that is the ritual practice of the Setians. Uh, they don't all know this yet, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, we've been kind of... Uh, group people. When I say the Setians, obviously there's the Templar set who have, uh, I should say, peace be upon them or whatever the Templar set. I have good relationships with people in the Templar set and the Church of Satan, but I'm not in a member of those groups, never have been. Uh, I kind of work in another group of uh, Setian people who are kind of a little bit more left field, I would guess. And we've been working with our spirits and possession trance uh, using some of this stuff and combining this. See, if you take the spells of the Greek magical papyri, you've got to kind of, it, it makes sense to kind of enliven them in with some spirit tr trance work uh, rather than just speak them. There's a third class of gin that causes incurable mental illness and there's no practitioners who can deal with that. Right? You just have to just let it go. As I say, uh, Sar trance is <coughs> is the exorcism cult, really, of Upper Egypt and Nubia and the Sudan. People think it's a women's mystery. Uh, it's certainly become one. It's become a sort of women's associated with a women's movement and belly dancing and stuff like that. But it it certainly isn't that in origin. It's mainly women who, uh, for one reason or another, become possessed. Or maybe, maybe it's in the cultures, maybe women, if you go back to ancient times, women like parties. Uh, it's like Hathor is a kind of ultimate beer monster, really. Uh, she likes to stay up all night and get pissed and have fun and stuff. Oh, what's that? Secret sign? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so even though it's now, right, I mean, so, uh, so I talked about this a little bit with Susan Laybourne, who's got another view of Sa. But then she said, oh, it's a women's mystery. And I said, well, well, the musicians are all men. And she says, yeah, but they're all gay men. I said, well, they're still men, aren't they? <laughs> you know? uh, for a start, I don't believe that for a minute, right? That all the musicians who who, who do the music for Zar Trance are all gay. <laughs> uh, why not? I have nothing against that, you know. I'm sure, you know, it's the same anywhere. But it just isn't true. Uh, Many of the musicians are men and women, you know, but certainly if you go back to the accounts of this in the 1930s, you will find uh, men and women doing this form of possession trance, you know, and mixed groups as well doing it, which is very, very unusual. Uh, that that Sa trance is a mixed group. I kind of, I don't know if I've got the picture. This is the god, uh, what did I say, the god Hekar. 
the god of magic. I don't know why this is, because it's very... <coughs> You can see why the, the Egyptians were kind of really kind of thought of as fantastic magicians. Because they, their representation of the god of magic is... A, it tells you that the god, magic is a god, right? Magic is a religion in ancient Egypt. Not that magic... Magic is the religion of ancient Egypt. It's their religion. Magic, what we call magic. Much more elevated than what we do uh, in many ways. But, uh, okay, next slide. Let's zip through them. Okay, I've shown that before. I'm trying to hope I got... Go on. These are pictures of decanal demons. <coughs> from the pharaonic tradition, <coughs> which are led by Set in one way or another. Okay, keep going. What is this book? And he said it's, it's by someone called Ahmed Albuni. Everybody, has everybody heard of Ahmed Albuni? Ah, it's a name trip off the tongue, Ahmed Albuni. Ahmed Albuni is, uh, whose name means the coffee bean, the bean. I think coffee, he must have drunk a lot of coffee, uh, which is an Egyptian thing, of course. Ahmed Albuni is the kind of Alistair Crowley of medieval Islam, really. He's a real expert on. Uh, on uh, magic, and it's his book that people use there. <coughs> uh, it's called The Source of the Essentials of Wisdom, the book. It's amazing. This guy said, oh, that's the source of the essentials of wisdom. And it's full of magical talismans, which if we could show you, you'd probably, maybe I'll just flick onto that just before we go, you'd recognize them. You would recogni recognize what they are. They're, they're, we, we know them sort of secondhand from the things like the Key of Solomon and from the Greek magical papyri. So it, it, what, it sh what it shows is, is this book was, uh, is a printed book, uh, is still in use in Egypt, uh, using the same techniques, and this is not just a academic, this is in use in Egypt in a very, very loaded situation. Uh, I'm not saying people do this, but he kind of has to think, um, what's the thing that you do in the grimoire? The primary task of the grimoire, one of the big things you would do in the grimoire is find treasure. Yeah, as I said. But we don't care about that because nobody ever finds any treasure in the West, do they? Yeah. They find little bits and pieces, but they don't really find treasure, right? Or at least, you tell me they did. If you're familiar with the Greek magical papyri, you'll see images like this. The Greek magical papyri, not as well done. So I'll finish on that. Uh, so Albuni, the trouble with Albuni is uh, not translated into English anywhere yet. Huge uh, compendiums of magical work, which... <coughs> We, which is amazing stuff, and this one, if you remember the first version of the talk, and the stuff, some of this stuff, right, is in the book Finetta, I'm right? not just plugging this, but it is there, the, and if you're familiar as well with the work of uh, Nineveh Shadrach, uh, magic that works or whatever it is called. Uh, Nineveh, check out the works of Nineveh Shadrach. He has an idea about the sevenfold, I mentioned the seven amulets, the seven seals. Seven seals of the, uh, obviously the book of Revelation are mentioned in our tradition. But in Islamic magic you use the seven seals. You see this in this. So in this book, which was published before I received this, I sort of start talking about the magic of the seven seals. So you have a basic magic of seven seals and saying where, how they first come into the Western tradition and how you use these. And they have seven seals, they have seven sounds, uh, seven gestures, blah, blah, blah. Quite a complex system. Well, no, quite a simple system. Anyway, the interesting thing about seven seals, they're not exactly Arabic. They're more like Egyptian hieroglyphs. And Al Booney says that the seven seals are a combination of uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Uh, 
So Islamic magic is interfaith. The Islamic magic of the medieval period is a combination of all religions. It's not like now. Anyway, so I said that, and then a blam, through the post, comes a talisman from a magical book in use in Luxor at this moment with the seven seals on them. See, these are not Arabic. One of the ones you recognize, the pentagram. The pentagram is <coughs> the pro one of the most important magical seals within Islam and within Egyptian magic, in fact. It's one of the oldest magical seals you you'll find <coughs> and in other systems. And they make a magic square of the seven seals. I don't know what the purpose of this is yet. I haven't translated it. But whatever, this is <coughs> rather remarkable. So, some of them are from the Torah, and some of them are from the Book of Revelation. Although, if you, I don't know, if you read the Bible, but in the Bible, it doesn't show you what they're like. <coughs> so, I don't know. I thought it was my theory had come full circle. Really, I started getting interested in the seven seals. Uh, put onto that, and I discovered essentially a system of sorcery that uses late Egyptian hieroglyphs within the, uh, within the Islamic world. And that, I thought, was good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> right, do we have any questions for Mark? That's not Egyptian, is it? The Pazuzu. Well, the Pazuzu is Mesopotamian, isn't it? Uh, but it's a good example of a uh, monster, really, rather than a demon. Uh, isn't, is, which is, if I can remember my own formula, it's a human head. So it's got a human head. You think it's a sort of doggy head. It's a human head on a kind of winged animal body. It's a bit human as well, but it's a monster, I think. Would you class Thoth or as an Egyptian Thoth. I know, yeah, I know. Well, that's an interesting... Well, I'm not saying they're demons, but they're kind of composite beings, aren't they? Which, and that, com that idea of uh, an animal head on a human body, if you go back to uh, Lascaux and some of these uh, really old Ice Age, or after the Ice Age c cave art, and you've got those images, that's, they are kind of this composite between human and animal. And lots of the early gods are kind of, they are that, I think. I mean, you think of Isis, the god, goddess Isis is really a, she's a bird goddess. And that's a very old image of, so see, Isis is really a combination of a human being and, a, and some sort of bird. A, bir a bird that probably eats flesh. It's probably a flesh, Isis and Ephes probably originally flesh-eating birds who ate corpses. Or who made a, a noise whenever they saw a dead body, like maybe like vultures or maybe like crows or something, they kind of make that noise. And that's her. so maybe all of the gods have that origin in as a composite creature. I don't know. Not, not that one. That is that's set. See, set is uh, set is. One of the weirdest of uh, Egyptian <coughs> constructions. Because you, you also got to think that Egypt, Egypt, they're very, very good at depicting animals, and uh, but it looks as if their human beings look a little bit cartoon-like. But it's obviously deliberate. There's obviously something deliberate about that, because it's not as if they don't know how to depict people really, really accurately. So all Egyptian art is very intentional. It's, 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 it's depicting something spiritual. But yeah, but Set has got a... No, but there's all sorts of theories about what that is. Uh, it, some people say it is a monster of some sort, to contradict myself, because he combines elements of, of biology that don't exist in the real world.
he's part do he's dog like and but then he's got these ears that no animal has got but other people think it is an animal but there you go Yeah, no, I think that's a good, good way of putting it. Monsters, monsters are more like angels then. They're, they're kind of sort of automata. <laughs> but it, I, I just saw, I got that idea from, I don't know if people are familiar with this thing called Gobekli Tepe, uh, which is the oldest uh, ritual, the oldest ritual temple uh, yet discovered with, with stone architecture and iconography. And the pictures from this place, in, which is in Turkey, uh, they kind of fit with the Egyptian system as well, the pillars and the, the, the images. But the guy who excavated that, he suggest he looked at these images and he said, he, it's his idea that demons are this way and monsters, and he says monsters don't exist before a certain time in our history when we had written records, in fact. So it's almost like when we got more intelligent and started writing books, the things that got us in our dreams were kind of more, um, we, we created something new that plagued us in our dreams. I don't know, it was just a, th I thought it was an interesting idea to work with for a bit. But, you know, when you're talking about, you say demons are animal heads, and human bodies, and you were talking about the um, images of the cave paintings that have that. Is it a more with the cave paintings that they, those are the magic practitioners and the shamans who are wearing the heads with a, uh, a sympathetic magical practice to negotiate with the spirit of a particular animal that they don't want wish to hunt. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that is always a possibility. That's a theory, though, isn't it? That uh, that these images that are depicted in uh, Gobekli Tepe and everything, they're supposed to be human practitioners uh, done in uh, spirit masks or animal masks, and sometimes they do find things that masks and everything. But I don't think it can be uh, explained the whole. The excavator of Gobekli Tepe, they found so many of these things that he, he thought it couldn't all be depictions of human beings. That they are complex creatures and I suppose then when you you could ask it the other way around when a human practitioner wears an animal mask then they are becoming that sort of composite creature aren't they they're becoming a kind of demon themselves or a spirit uh, this this weird creature which is not human and it is partakes of both of, of two worlds anything that gets you into two worlds at the same time the animal and the human or whatever is always magically powerful but yeah, I think both things are going to be true, aren't they? There's probably are people who don't that animal. They do that. It's like with that one, the Egyptian stuff. Same thing. Uh, are they masks? <coughs> and sometimes they did wear masks, right? But then they usually tell you that it's a mask. That you know, the the people who do the embalming of the corpses, they have to wear a mask with Anubis's head on and stuff. Um, people in boxing, doing fighting, when they're fighting each other in ritual combat, in festivals they wear masks of uh, all sorts of things. So they, they describe masks, but they also, I mean, the other complication with the Egypt, Egyptian culture is that, uh, an ancient culture, is that they worship the severed head. Uh, and the severed head has special magical meaning, which we don't completely know. So, say, so Hathor, the image of Hathor, because we're used to pit portrait busts of Shakespeare or wherever it is as being just the head. We think, oh, it's just an artistic convention. They didn't have enough marble to do the rest of it. <laughs> uh, but, the, so we can, but that's now. But in the past, that didn't apply. When they depict just a head, with no body, a headless creature, uh, one way or another, or a disembodied creature, that is, uh, and Osiris is often depicted as a severed head. Hathor is a severed head, Bez is a severed head. Uh, there's a, another mystery there <coughs> about, uh, and uh, it, lots of other cultures have this cult of the severed head. Uh, 
the Celts had severed heads as in their shrines also. So uh, in Hinduism, they liked severed heads, or, or see, the heads of John the Baptist in Freemasonry, all this sort of stuff. It's not just an artistic convention. It means something that we can, I don't know what it means. Tell me what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.